I'd like you all to imagine a village in India. It's an ordinary village, surrounded by hamlets, yellow and gold marigolds. The sound of singing can be heard. There's lime and mango trees around this whole place. And people are arriving from far and wide, local guests, foreign guests. And this is because it's, everyone's arrived for a, for a wedding celebration. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been to an Indian wedding before, but the amount of people you usually have is, it easily gets into the thousands. Now, all these guests will need feeding and watering. Um, and the way the calculation you usually do for an Indian wedding is uh, if you have about a thousand guests, you add their body weight up and you have the same amount in food there. So they probably have thousands of tons of food there. And all of them will need watering. Now, Indian tap water is not exactly what you'd call reliable. So what they used to do to make sure that all these guests were catered to is that they bored several, several large cauldrons every day. That was mainly to make sure that the water was safe for drinking and that the foreign guests whose stomachs aren't used to the local tap water um, don't, don't get ill or anything because the, the locals there will be more used to it. Now, imagine a day before the wedding is due to start. There's a young one-year-old boy. He's precocious. He's learnt to walk when he was nine months old. So being a one-year-old is no barrier to having a good look around. He's exploring around his new environment, the new sounds, the colours, the new smells. And he goes into the garden, this vast outside space. He's playing with the other kids, and he catches a glint in the corner. And that glint, he walks over to it, there's steam coming off it. And what it actually is, is these large cauldrons that they boil every day, with boiling hot water. He, he goes over to it. He doesn't realise, being a one-year-old, that that it's, uh, it's just been boiled, it hasn't actually cooled down. He goes over to it. As he peers in, he trips on the smooth stone slabs. His arm goes straight in. And remember, this is boiling hot water. Think this water is going to scar him. He goes straight in, he screams. His pi screams are piercing. His mother is there in seconds pulling him out. Now, my mother says she's been pulling me out of hot water ever since. <laughs> um, but it wasn't her fault, to be fair. I was, I, was a, I was a hooligan as a child, and it was difficult to manage. And I was only gone from her, under her supervision, for what, have, what probably seemed like seconds. Um, and I still have the burn scars on my left arm to this day. Several years of surgery later, it's, they've managed to give me an almost normal arm. Um, but they're useful to me, these burns. They remind me to ask every day, you know, why do people have to boil their water? It's a problem that people face on a daily basis all around the world, not just in India. And I don't want people to have to do this anymore. I don't want people to have to boil their water anymore, people to have to chemically treat their water anymore. And I don't just mean in Europe, America, Canada. I mean, sorry, I didn't mean just mean in developing countries. I mean in Europe, America, Canada, places where they still add chemicals to their water and they still, you know, we may not boil the water there, but they're chemically treating it. Now, you may think, um, I don't have to add chemicals to my water. Um, I'm in the UK. Well, you don't, but that's because somebody's already done it for you. What I'm saying is, what if we didn't have to do it anymore? We all know about water-related issues. You know, we, on the news, we see you know, uh, germs have got into the water source, infectious diseases, people dying in the third world. Of, you know, there's no lack of water. There's a, there's a lack of water, the water's infect, got infectious diseases in it, and we predominantly think of this as a third world problem. But it's not actually a third world problem. It's not only a third world problem. What I'm trying to say is it's also a first world issue. Just recently, we had a, a shortage of water in California. Now, this is a country that we consider as a superpower, possibly the most developed country in the world. You may argue that currently of what's going on, but... Um, you know, they, people didn't have access to water in California, and that was recently, they had to control the amount they were drinking, the amount that they could use for swimming, their bathing water, water, water to water their garden. In Scotland this year, people in Avermore were complaining of a chlorine taste in their water. After Scottish water changed the water supply, they started bubbling chlorine gas through a new water source, and people who were drinking the water from the taps could actually taste the chlorine in their water. In the north of England, we had a cryptosporidium problem in Yorkshire. Now, cryptosporidium is not necessarily a deadly virus, but if it gets into the, the 
the water supply. Up, up there, it got into the drinking water supply. It can be fatal if you have a compromised immune system or uh, uh, for the children or for the elderly. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is it's not just a third world problem. It's also a, it's also a problem for us here and now in the first world. And I think that we're all guilty in the developed world of our, the way that we think about water. We take it for granted. We have an instantaneous relationship with our water. It's always there. We turn a tap on, we turn a faucet on, we run a bath, we run a shower, we swim in water. We don't think how, you know, what happens to that water for it to get to us. It's always there. It's instantaneous. And that can be easy to forget sometimes that 633 million people around the world don't have access to safe water. To put that into perspective, that's double the population of the United States. That's about one in every 10 people in the world. And yes, that is a third world problem, but it's not just a, a, a problem of um, infectious diseases or people not having access to water. It will affect us in the developing world, in the developed world, sorry, because we will also, you know, it has an economic impact. We don't have access to water. You know, industry will collapse. We can't water our crops that feed us. Um, the, the impact would be huge. We'd feel it in our, in our pockets, is what I'm trying to say. So, you know, places like the World Bank have said, by the time we get to 2050, if we don't address certain water scarcity issues in the developed world, our gross domestic product could go down by as much as 6% annually. Now, if you think about that, you know, what we're trying to see, the wealth that we think that we have today will go because of, you know, compromised water sources. So it's something that we have to address here and now. In terms of devastation, the World Economic Forum says, you know, more than climate change, more than anything else, access to clean water, you know, without, you know, ha the lack of it is the most devastating impact to human civilization. I would even go as far as to say it's probably one of humanity's greatest challenges. So a few years ago, I met my current business partner and I discovered a new technology. Now, this technology, what was amazing about it is it, it, for the first time I saw something that allowed us to treat water, make it available for people in a sustainable way. Not, you know, without the use of chemicals, we didn't have to do, uh, we didn't have to boil the water. It was something that could treat water and make it available for everyone. Um, now, just to give you a bit of, you know, why we started using chemicals, you know, what we, di what we did is as the human population grew, and it grew so fast, our consumption of resources grew exponentially. And one of those things, the predominant thing that we all need is water. We all know, we've all grown up knowing how vital water is to, to organic life forms, to all humans. Um, you know, everyone knows that. But the problem is that we started using it and abusing it. As we, as we used it in industry, we used to dump it back in, into the water courses, into the table water, into the rivers, and we didn't actually clean that water. So over a period of time, what we did was disrupt nature's natural equilibrium. Nature cleans water very, very well itself. What we needed to do, though, because our consumption of water went up so dramatically, is that we needed to, to use it faster than nature could clean it. We started then adding chemicals to the water. Chemicals sped up the process, we used to use, you know, we bubble chlorine gas through it to make it clean, disinfect it so it's safe for drinking. Um, so I'm going to show you how this works. I'm going to turn it on here. So what we call this, this new technology, is sono electrical chemistry. What we do is we pulse the water with sound waves, with sonar ultrasound, and we pass electric current through it. Now, if you imagine water as billion, billions of electrically charged uh, particles, where all the contaminants have a charge and the water has a charge. What we're doing is that we're creating particle separation in the water so we can get clean water out and the contaminants out by, by creating a, 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 a charge differential in the water. Now, I've seen loads of water gadgets. I've probably seen about 10, 20 different investment ideas that people have come up with, and there's loads of them out there, and you've probably all seen them. You have things like membrane filters. There was a neat little one which they, which they marketed to, uh, to the third world that had a was on a trolley, and as, you, as, you, as the wheels rolled, the membrane filter rotated through the water, and the dirt came out one end and the water came out the other. Now, all these technologies work, and they do clean water. But the difference here is that now, for the first time, we have a technology that works at scale. 
uh, just to let you know what we've put in here, this is something we call this red brick die. So this is the red dye that they put in your house bricks that you see that we use in the UK. That's not stuff that you'd want to drink, and it goes into the water courses in the UK, and we have to take it out. Now you can probably see it settling. So what you can see there now is the contaminant. The red brick dye has gone up to the top, and all of this is clean drinking water. It almost looks like magic. I, I still remember the first time I saw it, and it blew me away. Um, but what this technology allows us to do is three things, mainly. The first thing is it can reduce our dependence on chemicals. Now, we treat most of our water in the UK and in the developed world using chemicals. It can only be a good thing to reduce that chemical usage that goes, you know, we drink it, we swim in it, we bathe in it, we cook with it, this water. Um, it can only be a good thing to make it as nature intended. So to make it clean and using this technology would reduce our dependence on chemicals. The third thing, the second thing, sorry, is uh, water scarcity. We could, with this technology, because of its sustainable nature and the fact that we can, can, we can treat so many different contaminants without using chemicals, it means that we, water scarcity wouldn't be such an issue because we could treat a whole range of different types of waters, contaminated water, and we could use that water in places where that water was scarce. The third thing is a contamination. Because of the power ultrasound, so what that does is as we pulse the water with sound waves, it smashes apart the bacteria and the viruses. So we're, we're in... It, we're disinfecting the water. Now, this technology is not necessarily new. There is evidence that we've, um, you know, in ancient Sanskrit uh, uh, texts, that they were using it 2,000 years ago. The Romans were using silver vats. There's even uh, proof, it's hotly contested, but there's even proof that the Egyptians were doing something similar to electrolysis. The difference now is that we understand the process, we understand how it works which means that we can manipulate it to take out a whole range of different contaminants in a, in, a more, in a more natural way. Now, the way that we treat water in the UK to start to understand how we can create that paradigm shift to, to using this technology is that we we've have two things. We have a wastewater treatment plant where industrial effluent, human sewage, etc. goes in. We clean that. We do a range of processes to it that water then gets released back into rivers. It's not drinking grade, but it's enough to be, it's of a quality to be released back into the environment. We then have drinking water plants. Now these plants, we treat the water and they get piped straight to your homes. That, those plants where we treat the water, they get piped hundreds of kilometers all over the place. You know, when you turn your tap on and your faucet on in the house and water comes out, that's connected to a pipe, ultimately that goes back to a utility plant that might be 100 kilometers away. What we can start to think about with this technology is instead of having that ridiculous pipe network of thousands of kilometers, we could start to think about point-of-use systems. We could have these systems at the point of use. So imagine you're in your house, you're in a factory, wherever you want to use clean water, you have a system that cleans it for you. What that then stops us from doing is treating water hundreds of kilometers away, piping clean water through a pipe network. It travels, let's say, you know, 10 kilometers, whatever, gets to you, half of that water is lost in the pipe. So what you've effectively done in your water bill is you've paid money to have something treated where half of it's lost before it gets to you. What, we, what this will also allow us to do, this technology, is actually reduce the cost that you pay for your water bill, for the cost of water, effectively. You know, that's, that is a large shift that we, need to, that we could begin to start thinking about of having point-of-view systems, but I believe it's the future of water treatment. We don't need to have this model where we treat water in you know, giant sewage treatment facilities or drinking water facilities, we can move it to a point of view system. And affect, you know, so that's another thing that it gives us is the, the ability to reduce the cost of water treatment. And it does seem, you know, it does seem like a gift that keeps giving. But actually the challenge, you know, the challenge will be great. We've got to, you know, figure out, you know, how do we get governmental bodies to change infrastructure planning? You know, working, you know, these things we all know how long they take to plan. Any government projects, any big inf infrastructure projects can take decades. But if we start thinking about the next step, if people start understanding the fact that you know, water-related issues are not just a developing world problem, they're a, they're a developed world issue as well. You know, that we could have water that is better, water that effectively is just water. Now, what, you know, and as I referred to earlier, we can start to re restore nature's natural equilibrium. And that's ultimately what I think we should do. It can only be better for us as, as, as the human race to be consuming water that is as nature intended and not um, 
using water that's been dosed with chemicals, etc. Now, um, I realise I'm going to be a father for the first time in September, and uh, having a girl, and I think about the world that she'll be growing up into. And if we can start to make this uh, a reality, and to here and now, we all, as, as, as a population, we start to think about the way that we change water, you know, the world that Shu will grow up into when she graduates in 20 years' time. The aim should be to have water that's always safe, always sustainable, always available, and always affordable to everyone on the planet. There's no reason that, you know, that we should have 633 million people without water. We have the technology and the means to do it, and we, I think that we can make it a reality if we start to think about it and create that paradigm shift within ourselves. But even before that, when my daughter's just a one-year-old, and I want to take her to India to see her relatives. She's precocious like me. She's learning to walk when she's nine months old. And she runs out into the garden. And she sees a big container of water. I don't have to stop her from throwing herself in, because it will just be water, and a paddling pool and filled with water, water that's just water. Thank you.